the Independent Investor Channel. We just closed out 2021 here um, in, 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 a, in an awesome fashion. I, I thought going out of 2021 on a high note was important. I, my expectations were low. Um, I, I was very, very pleased on a lot of different fronts. And uh, I wanted to release my reaction to these earnings. But I, I tell you what, um, I'm going to have to go back and review these a few times. Uh, there was so much jammed into this call that um, uh, it, it's going to require some some due diligence alone just on the call. I, and I, I, I don't mean to say that one way or the other to say I, I'm past whether or not you want to invest in this company or not. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm looking to provide this from an awareness perspective. And I, what's going on here is insane. Um, it, it's insane. Um, they've just booked revenue for the first time, 200,000. Okay. Bears are like, that's stupid. You know, they're going to run out of money, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's all wrong. Um, I, I don't know if there's, if the opposing forces at work here with Hylian are, are becoming that much more glaring now, but if Shuri Baker's calling for two to three million, which a lot of people are like, oh, how can they survive with the burn rate, blah, blah, blah. What does that represent for 200,000 total revenue in 2021 and an anticipated revenue of two to three million? You're talking about a few hundred percent of increase year over year. That is enormous, guys. And it wasn't just about the 200,000 of, of, of revenue that needed to be judged on its own right? Is it high? Is it low? Is it below expected? None of that matters. What matters is that they generated revenue for the first time. Now we have a revenue metric to go upon going forward. And Sherry Baker's just outlined what she expects. Let's say on the, on the, on the low end, we're talking about 600 million uh, of, uh, or 600,000 uh, of revenue uh, per quarter, let's say 400 on the low end. Okay. That puts us at 1.2 for the year. Let's say on the high end, we're talking about 612, 1824, 3 million, let's say with 600,000 uh, of revenue. Okay. Uh, per, 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 per a quarter going into 2022. Look at the revenue increase year over year. This is enormous. This is not to be ignored. And it, it only, it only lends itself to what I will articulate in this video when we jump into the actual presentation itself, what I consider to be a countdown from now until the end of 2023, 24 months from now, okay? We're talking about stepping up into mass scale, going from low volume production to, um, to ramping up the scale. Now, did we hear what we needed to hear during the Q4 uh, call closing out 2021 enough to give us an indication that there is interest uh, being garnered within the industry? I would say overwhelmingly yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be a cheerleader here. I was stoked on the call. My expectations were low. I'll explain that in the video. Um, but I, I thought, you know, for me, the tone and tenor was a lot different. I, I think listening to this call was a lot different. I think they were both speaking from, I don't know where the confidence came from. Um, I think I have an inkling in that they're um, in touch with all of the interactions with industry and understanding where the vision may take them into the future. Um, and I think that came through in the delivery. I do. Um, I, I hardly recognized the confidence of the CEO. Um, Sherry Baker was on point, but she was Specifically on point during this call, uh, I thought she was fabulous during the Q&A session, um, and I thought both of them together, both from my perspective, got an A. Uh, on the delivery, I thought the tone and tenor was absolutely spot on. I thought it was perfect. I thought it was wonderful. Um, I, I thought they delivered exactly what they needed to, to summarize um, what has been a tough year. I, I think if I'm going to compare 2021 to 2022, I want to say that we've left the, the worst year behind us. I, I really do. Um, I look at 2022 as a bridge year. I do. I look at a bridge year and, and whether or not we remain in this, you know, range of, of four to $12. I, I think we end the year 2022 in the $12 range. I, I think that's fair. Um, I think it could surprise and I think it should. I, I think it should. There was enough on the call. That's why I need to go back and really scrutinize that call because God, it was it was masterfully done. It was a masterful call. Um, there was way too much that was turned out. Every single statement that was made, the Q&A session lasted half of the call. Um, that was unprecedented. So 
the, the amount of interest in this, and of, of course you had Delaney and Fisher come out and uh, obviously um, offer, I think the downgrade came after it. There was a downgrade of some sort. None of that matters anymore. Um, I, I hold no, um, no credibility to these analysts anymore, none. When it comes to these companies like this, this company is garnering way too much attention uh, for a company by these analysts, uh, best estimation, um, are, are just going to continue to tread water and continue to struggle going forward. Um, and, and they haven't woke up to the fact that this is a very real opportunity coming out of 2022. If they're able to garner the two to three million in revenue, it's going to be huge, huge. I mean, God, you, you, you're talking about two, two million on the low end, right? Which is, you know, $500,000 per quarter. If they have a revenue increase from 200,000 to 500,000 quarter over quarter, if they just hold true on the low end of the projections from what Sherry Baker said that they're going to garner in revenue here going through 2022, I don't see how the stock doesn't fly. I just don't. And I, I think I just came to the rev revolution uh, or the, the, um, you know, the, the uh, conclusion based on those pro projections where a lot of people are like two to three million, that's nothing. Oh, that's a far cry from nothing. That's hundreds of percent of increase year over year uh, in, in, in projections. Now, if they're looking to do three million on the high side, right, you're talking about 750,000 per quarter. Oh my gosh, guys, that, that's huge. I mean, that's getting up close to a million dollars per quarter just on the EX product alone. That is the standalone, okay? There will be no revenue that is realized from any other product in the hybrid EX in 2022, none. And I think the two to $3 million mark represents a hell of a lot more um, than, just, than just on the, on the surface. I, I think it's incredible to look at the quarter over quarter increases the potential for, let's say they just come out and they double it in the first quarter of 2022, okay? And they boost it up to 400,000. And then the next one is, you know, getting up into, let's say 600,000. 600, There's your million for the year right there. Tack on another 500,000 per quarter after that, you've got your 2 million. But if it continues to increase and you've got your four and you've got your six, and then they end up doing a 650 or a 750, a uh, uh, $1,000 order, uh, order book, right, from the hybrid EXs, uh, and then you turn out maybe a beat on top of that to go into 2023, you're talking about a revenue increase quarter over quarter over quarter sequentially in 2022. The, the stock cannot be denied. And it seemingly, it will get no love in the stock market, that's for sure. But I thought the team build out was a highlight, absolutely. I, I thought Thomas talking for the first time against building out the reservation order book was huge. He got a fist pump from me a few times when he said that. Um, he got a fist pump from me when he talked about shareholder value. This was the first time in all of the uh, interviews that I've ever watched Thomas Healy, him mention shareholder value. First time he mentioned it one time during the call. And I, I, he got a fist pump out of me when he said it because I heard it. Um, and I speak pretty good English. And the last thing is the expectations for 2022, going into 2023, mass scale and build up second half of 2023, and the certification, the NIPSA, uh, the CARB and the EPA certifications into 2023. Um, we should have the fleet demos all complete. We should have the controlled uh, fleet uh, type of uh, application where the Hylion solution is put into the fleets to run the routes just like they would under normal rigor. I think that's going to be amazing. And I think the countdown starts now. So it's it's awesome to be on this journey with you guys. It's great to evolve. It's great to facilitate the discussion. No better than me to do it. I've been intimately involved with this company since it's been rolled out. It's been a, a, a pleasure um, to really evolve with the goings on at, the, at this company. And I think going into 2022, I, I think we're starting at about as low of a stock price as we could possibly get. Now, I'm not saying it can't go lower because it, it, it's proven that it can. But if you're talking about specifically that revenue growth quarter over quarter, th there's no way that you can articulate that this stock goes lower and lower going into what I consider to be a bridge year, kind of a moderating year. Whereas we just came out of what hopefully for me and what I think it will be the worst year 
uh, in the evolution of this company in 2021. It's nice to put a, a closure to that, and it's going to be really nice to see some of the nuggets come to fruition that were alluded to on the call, guys. So we're going to jump in. We're going to cover the call together. I'm going to walk you through. I'm going to give you my, my, uh, my insights. If you guys don't want this long-standing video, I did uh, release a short video with all of the nuggets in line. There were 30 positives that I was able to extrapolate with the help of one of my colleagues in the community. I shared those during the short video. That's 15 minutes. You can kick over there, catch it. If you don't have the time to sit through uh, the hour uh, highly on video, which I, I need that. I need that to really give you my granular insight on where I think it, that, what, what it means, um, on the call, um, what are some of the things that I picked up on, what it could potentially mean, and where it could potentially mean going forward as we look to solidify the roadmap that was doubled down on by both Thomas and Sherry going forward with Hylion Holdings as we step into Q1 of 2022, guys. So we'll drop you into the, the presentation. We'll cover it together. So welcome, everybody, into the earnings call here for fourth quarter. Uh, closing out 2021, which uh, in my humble opinion has been a uh, fairly dismal year. There's no doubt about it. it it's been dismal on um, the, the stock side of the house. I, I think if nothing else, this earnings call solidified for me uh, uh, what I've been saying all along with regard to the disconnect between the stock market and and what the company is doing, which is fabulous. So the disconnect is, is very real. Um, it is still apparent um, that uh, no matter what this company does, they're not going to get a nod um, until they start to um, turn out uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars of revenue, uh, and be the one company in the entire stock market that has no debt um, and is... Um, uh, selling their product uh, on a mass scale to the global markets uh, before this gets any type of favor. Uh, but I do want to highlight and go through the PowerPoint with you guys to discuss some of the uh, takeaways, um, really some of the tie-ins from the call. My expectations going into this call were very dismal. I, I mean, it couldn't have been lower. Sentiment for me was, was very, very low. And I will just say right at the top of this, I have been monitoring since the call was released uh, the sentiment across the social media landscape um, and it's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, I, I'm not sure if I would put myself in the overwhelmingly positive camp. Um, I, I hate to be the naysayer. I, I hate to, to be um, in any camp um, or be called upon with uh, uh, a, a group of, of people who feel more comfortable in groupthink rather than challenging what was actually actually released, with, which I thought was fraught with really good news on a lot of different fronts. Um, I think in 2023, I think they're going to have to do more. Um, I think they're going to have to step into, and that's part of the reason why I sent my comments down with Jason with JMAC Investing to address with Thomas directly with regard to um, the uh, mod centers um, and the OEM hubs. I think that's going to be critical. Um, the company cannot continue to to, to make anemic uh, revenues, which was a, a takeaway from 2021. They did post revenue. We'll talk about that. Um, but they cannot continue to operate at this burn rate indefinitely. And and everybody in the Hylion camp um, either has their, their perspectives on this one way or the other. Um, I said that they could not operate indefinitely, and they cannot, okay? You, you can argue with me. There's some people who say that it's no problem. They can just continue to burn through cash with no problem without um, any, any type of sales rendering to fortify this book. And we're going to take a look at the numbers, how they shook out. I'm going to... I'm going to talk about, you know, the 200,000 in, in EX sales um, was great from the perspective that they broke through and they reported earnings for the first time. I think that's that's all great, okay? But in reality, until this company gets to that uh, uh, that uh, that that phase where they transition from low volume sales to high volume sales, which is looking like it's a couple of years out from even here. Um, which I, I don't necessarily look at that as a positive. It is what it is. Um, I'm fairly neutral on it insofar as if, if that's what it is, then that's what it is. 
Um, some people might look at it and say, well, I'm not going to invest in the company. That's your prerogative. Um, but I think here at $4, this presents a fascinating, fascinating opportunity uh, to look at this company that is seemingly turning out an awful lot of nuggets and casting a very, very wide net in getting some and garnering some in incredible attention. And we're going to talk about some of that feedback um, that was rendered on the call here. So um, let's cruise through here. I'm going to roll past the disclaimer real quick, and we're going to get down into into some of the highlights here. Um, the achievements, uh, Tommy, uh, Tom, Thomas Healy and, and Sherry Baker both did a fabulous job on the call. Um, I gave them both A's. Uh, I thought it was uh, the tone and tenor was different. Um, I, I thought from a, from a listener's perspective, I thought they spoke a lot more from uh, a commanding position in that they, they understood the insides and outs of, of what they were doing. Um, where there was uh, anemic numbers to be to be uh, um, uh, shared, um, they, 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 they stated that. Um, where there was delay based on supply chain issues, they stated that, stated it with confidence. And, um, it seemed to me that there was a lot more going on that they wanted to talk about behind the scenes, and it was really came to a head when Mark Delaney asked his question about getting any type of interest from the Innovation Council. He said, well, ironic that you've mentioned that. We just had an order come in yesterday. Um, so I, I, I think uh, more to follow. Uh, I, I think there was a couple takeaways for me that uh, maybe the untrained ear would not have picked up on. There was a, a bunch of those that I picked up on those those calls, enough to where I actually gave kind of a, kind of a right on. You know, it was nice to hear uh, Thomas Healy acknowledge shareholder value. He only said it once during the call if you picked up on it. Um, I, I found that to be uh, extremely, extremely nice uh, to finally acknowledge that this is a publicly traded company, and, and the goings on at the company will, at some point, reflect um, all this groundwork that they're putting in place. And shareholders in the company understand that um, it, it's going to be a tough, it's going to be a tough go until they get to that point. Uh, but man, when they when they turn the corner and they start mass producing this product, it's lights out. Um, and I'll, I'll probably stop covering Hylion with such a weekly frequency. You know, I maybe go to a, 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 a one-month frequency or a quarterly frequency because it's going to transition to a long-term type of a project from there um, as these orders uh, start to be pushed out to the fleets. And um, I really wanted to draw a disconnect between what uh, Thomas Ely was continually doubling down on um, with regard to where he feels the industry is evolving to with range extenders, number one, and number two, the uh, I guess the threat of, uh, of a, a BEV future, an all-electric future um, for these trucks. He did double and triple down on the 100 miles of range, which I, I just, I don't understand why, you know, these, these um, the BEV companies are getting such a pass. I, I don't know if they're uh, so, so heavily scrutinized. I mean, on the Nikola report, they are estimating three to five hundred um, orders um, on their um, on on their tray truck. Um, well, what is it? Is it three hundred? Is it five hundred? And Hylion just doesn't do that. Um, I think they're pretty right on with their numbers, and I I do believe that their estimates are are, are credible. They they've provided us no reason as to why they they, they shouldn't be credible. Um, whereas Nikola just putting a range out there to say, well, we're, we're either going to sell 300 or 500. Well, that makes a big difference to the bottom line. What is it? Are you garnering enough interest to make an educated decision on how many units you're going to sell? I mean, Hylion was right down to the granular number on, on what they projected here. So um, the 2021 achievements to highlight here, the Hypertruck ERX new orders and reservations, which to bring me to my second uh, bullish um, thing that I took out of the call was Thomas Healy talked about solidifying the order backlog. I, I've been talking about this for all of 2021. I didn't understand why they weren't aggressively going at this. Not only did they aggressively go at it, but they were order they were able to uh, garner and solidify that order book going forward. Now I think going into 2023. Um, when they're going to start to ramp up production at the end of 2023, I think they're going to have deposits on hand and they're going to have a reservation order book where they've already defined, and Thomas Healy went into intimate detail, talking about how a, a, a truck order of two trucks from a fleet doesn't represent 
a good or a bad order. He, he also articulated that an order of 50 Hypertruck ERXs didn't represent a good or bad order. What it represented was the commitment from the fleets at the time that they're making the commitment to start the integration to a range extender type of a solution into their uh, fleet rotation, okay? And, and he went on to talk about how it just makes sense, and that's how these orders come to fruition, talking about these reservation slots being filled, uh, highly on talking about their place in that uh, opportunity to reserve those uh, uh, reserve slots into the future. Um, he, he talked about that just being part of the industry, and, it, and it's a part of the industry that I didn't understand uh, as much as I did after the call because he added some color to that to that element of how this solution is going to be introduced into the fleets. But uh, the hybrid EX update and outlook uh, were, were somewhat uh, glim. Uh, they weren't good. Um, this is one of those things that... You know, if, if we're going to garner three million in revenues from the hybrid EX, uh, I think that's a token number, and I, I I don't put a lot of value to the bottom line to this. But on my units sales video that I did on on uh, uh, on Hylion, I spoke about this very thing. Okay, the very product that is going to drive those hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue is going to be the hyper truck ERX. And if by nature of the hybrid EX sales, we garner the knowledge, Thomas talked about some electrical specifications um, that they found out through the learnings of having the EX uh, in the hands of fleets out there, and they're able to incorporate all of those learnings into the Hypertruck ERX um, as it's turned out of the line, um, I, I think that's a, that, that's a net positive over the long term because I think what's going to end up happening is the Hypertruck ERX is going to morph into two very specific products. Number one, the renewable natural gas uh, side of the house uh, and the fuel agnostic stepping into the uh, hydrogen fuel cell offering. And I think those are going to be two very attractive uh, options or solutions for fleets out there. And I, and I think holistically, if I'm looking at this guys between the lines, Think about that. What what that does for the fleets? I, I don't think diesel is going away. Okay, I think all of these solutions are stepping into a less reliant future on diesel. But look at where we are now with the diesel prices up above three dollars a gallon, and we're looking at these solutions as a tangible reality in the future for fleets to deploy in their operations to be able to deploy down to the granular nature, the most efficient solution for a specific route. Right now, they're tethered to uh, the, the uh, price fluctuation of diesel, and I don't think fleets like to be there. If I was running a business, I would love to have optionality in my business in running the fuel of choice. If RNG is readily available along my route, then wonderful, I can run that. If I wanted to step into the potential of exploring new technology with hydrogen fuel cell, then that option is going to be uh, available. And Hylion is is really, it, it, they're just sitting in the driver's seat right here to really make a huge impact on the industry as a whole. And the interest that was garnered, garnered by the fleet feedback only suggests that these fleets are really, really hungry to get their hands on these products uh, as they uh, step into mass scale availability for these fleets to know that they can purchase these products after all of the validation and all of the certifications uh, have been completed, okay? So the hybrid update, you know, it is what it is. The company is going to evolve. Um, and, and I think that um, monitoring the competitive landscape, which uh, has been a continual theme of Thomas Healy, he talked about this on the call in that when he talks to fleets, fleets are interested in holding out until they can get an all electric or an, uh, a, a range extender type of product rather than going with a hybrid product. I totally understand that on you know, the side of the fleets, the hybrid EX is only good for certain applications um, and where that application fits, it's a good product, it really is. 
but I think fleets are really holding out here for the bread and butter, and that bread and butter being the Hypertruck ERX, okay? So we scroll down here. Um, financial updates were provided here, um, but I do want to talk about the team a little bit. This was huge. Um, the, the team was, uh, was built out nicely. Jay Craig was added to the team. Um, he was the former Meritor CEO. I thought that was positive. And then Sherry Lance um, from Meritor as well as the new chief Str uh, strategic officer for Hylion is going to head up their hydrogen fuel cell division, which was mentioned multiple times on the call. Um, I thought the stock should have shot to $10. I really do. I mean, if Nikola is going to have a favor for hydrogen fuel cell and, and, and they're going to be priced as being a leader in the industry, um, then Hylion deserves that uh, competitive uh, of metric going forward, and they're not being awarded that metric. As a matter of fact, uh, of course, to the analysts, who I don't have a lot of respect for at all, um, at all, um, who are always on the, the q and I was unavailable to offer my question. I was going to. I was going to hop on the call and ask my questions directly to Thomas and Sherry. But I didn't have a chance. I was actually very, very busy during the call, and I did not have the chance. Um, but the disconnect couldn't be more real, uh, and that uh, disconnect is alive and well now. Um, with the stock holding true, it did pop a little bit. Um, going into earnings, it, it dove huge during the day where the invasion took place. Um, I thought that was a little bit of, of a double whammy, but look, I, I'm not investing in Hylion to be at the whims of uh, geopolitical risk or you know not being able to circumvent um, uh, supply chain issues. I need Hylion to be able to stand on their own two feet, and they sure did that. Um, they roared back above that $4 mark, which I thought was big, and, and I think if nothing else, as we march toward that end of 2023, where winter validation is, is completed at the end of this year, certifications first half of 2023, and mass scale uh, uh, fleet uh, production is supposed to roll out in 2023. That's the time frame. And we'll talk about it a little, little bit when we get to the time frame slide, but that's what we're working against. And the, the stock is not going to remain at $4. And not with all the positives that I heard on the call, it's not going to remain there. Um, and, and I think people are going to look back at this as uh, an amazing, amazing time where the stock has held so low for so long because of the unique nature of this company coming public through the SPAC process, earning their funding, and, and really just accelerating this product to market. And I tell you what, guys, if you want to know my insight to this, it seems as if they're doing it. If they're able to pull this sucker off, which I was, I was pleased after the call. In what has been an absolutely dismal year with coffee cups and a stock price that has gone peak to trough 90% uh, down uh, over the course of it, I, I thought this call blew it out of the water. I thought there was a lot to be really excited about. And when you look at it from that perspective, going public in 2020 and being able to go from 2020 to 2023, end of second half of 2023 to mass scale and production, that's nothing short of remarkable. Uh, in the eyes of the stock market, in the eyes of an evolution of the company, they, they, they have the potential here to do exactly what they said they were going to do. Take the, that public funding through the SPAC process, use that funding to their benefit, and everything that I look at in their, in their financials suggests that they're doing just that. I love the R&D figure. I love it. When I look at seven over 17 million of R and D spending, I, I love it. When I look at the SGMA uh, budget that they've got going on, I, I look at that as being very, very lean business. They, they're able to run this business on 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 very little. A lot of people look at it and say, "Well, Ryan, they've only made two hundred thousand this year. How can they make it if they're burning one hundred and thirty-five million? Well, they're going to be able to make it because as as that. As that cost of production goes up per year, right now the company is running off of 125, 135 million is what they're projecting uh, for uh, 2022. But, but the thing about it is, guys, this company carries no debt. They do have a lot of cash, cash equivalents, short and long term investments around just shy of 600 million dollars in cash and cash equivalents on their balance sheet. We'll talk about that when we get to it, but. 
Most companies that we invest in are heavily laden with debt. This company doesn't have any debt, and it was doubled down on by Sherry Baker when she was pressed a little bit on, you know, the necessity to seek out new funding uh, into the future. And Sherry Baker just said, no, we're, we're, we're good. We're good for now. And they are. They certainly are. Any revenue, and this is why the 200000 although dismissed by the Bears um, as being uh, Im immaterial, which it is by all intents and definitions, but you have to look at it a little bit more broad spectrum than that in that this company has the ability now to earn revenue against that, uh, that, that order book. It has the ability to earn revenue against that cash hoard and position. Guys, if they're able to do this in the time frames that they're suggesting, they'll meet their time frames. And it's just not my opinion. Sherry Baker said that they should have no problem realizing their strategic business plan going forward to get to mass scale and integration integration and guys god dang i tell you what the verticals was freaking out before the fourth quarter call i listened to the fourth quarter call and i was like god dang these guys might actually do this they might actually do it and there was a lot of those things that i talk about all the time with investing a lot of people want to look at the knowns and they want to look at the knowns and they want to make their decision on the knowns I thought there was a lot of unknowns that you could not have been privy to. You would have had to have been an investor in the company to enjoy those unknowns that were uh, rolled out on this call particularly. Um, but um, recognized companies' first revenue, I thought that was huge. And I, I, I don't want you guys to focus so much on it and say, well, they're only making, they only made 200000 last year, first time uh, revenue earning. You know, how are they going to make it, Ryan, if they're burning $135 million? Guys, that is for the entire year. We have an entire year of this focused, driven company with a, an industry out there that is hungry for this product. Don't be so short-sighted, okay? This is not a pre-revenue company anymore, okay? So that is a huge milestone in the evolution of this company that's trying to bring a solution to bear and is earmarking right now a very specific date in our near future. 24 months from now, guys, we are going to be looking at a company with a completely different set of characteristics. We are going to be looking at a company that has evolved in their R&D. These 17 million or so of quarterly spending in R&D, these are not going to go for nothing, okay? R&D is key for a company like this that, yes, is an industrial company, but I consider it to be an industrial technology company. And I think that the metric that it's being provided right now is horrendously stupid. It really is. The order book that they're looking to build against right now with over 2,000 Hypertruck ERX orders it's not fair to award them a, a, a growth multiple of, of 20x. It's just not right. It's just not right. And Mark Delaney and Fisher, they're on this whole stream where they can play this vein because they've been right in the short term. Being right in the short term for a long-term investor means absolutely nothing. And there's two schools of thought here. These guys are going to be right for an indefinite amount of time. The question is, how right are they going to be for the following coming months as we step into and start to chip away against that 24-month timeline going into mass scale and production, going into the back half of 2023? I, the verdict is still out. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. And eventually, these guys will be wrong. And they'll have to revise to the upside, and they will, because that's their whole job. They can't conveniently go against the status quo like me and say, hey, I've, I'm still... Uh, uh, um, holding true on my $24 price target, very, very simple. We'll be halfway toward that latter half of 2023 goal by then, and I believe that this company will be above $20 a share. I believe it will. If it ends 2022 at 12 bucks a share, no problem. I'll just reaffirm my price target for 2023 at 2024, but uh, at $24. But going into 2023, I'm going to have to revise to the upside again because once the hint is out that this company is actually going to be able to uh, enjoy that catalyst from low volume production to mass scale, that's what we're talking about right now, guys. All this other crap, the 200,000 of EX, it's not going to matter. 
It's not going to matter. What's going to matter is the domino effect that's going to take place when industry gets a hold of these hypertruck ERXs and wants to fly the flag of Hylion knowing that they're stepping into the potential for other solutions out there like hydrogen fuel cell and that they get to keep the OEMs that they've learned to love over the last hundred years. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. Completed uh, major product development milestones for the Hypertruck ERX. That's true. More than doubled the size of the Hylion team and expanded the board of directors. I've already kind of talked about that a little bit um, with the addition of Jay Craig and Sherry Lance, um, as well as their uh, sales team expanded to include four new veterans uh, in the industry. And um, I, I thought that was huge. I thought the expansion of the team and you know, the Bears look at this as being a, a, a terrible thing. I, you know, it takes an imagination to be a Bear. I guess it takes an imagination to be a Bull, too. I guess time will be the very catalyst that proves one right over the other, I guess. And um, both of the um, uh, uh, perspectives and opinions on Hylion from a Bear or Bull perspective, um, they're wonderful. Um, they add to the, uh, to the robust nature of the discussion. It's fascinating. This is a fascinating story. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll be interested. And, and, and when I look at it from a Bulls perspective, I look at it like building out the team and bringing on this expertise, these industry leaders, that um, uh, these sales teams and, and doubling their team in 2021. Th this is not a company that believes that there, there isn't great things on the horizon. You know, companies just don't order trucks to order trucks for the fun of it. They don't do that. They especially don't put down deposits on orders that they don't have intention of following through with. And I thought that that was a huge part of the call. It was a part of the call that I did not expect. Um, I did not expect that Sherry Baker was going to come out and define uh, for the shareholding community and the investor community at large that orders and reservations will fall under two distinct categories. I thought that was huge. Orders are paid with deposits. Reservations are how many trucks a fleet could adopt, and I thought that that was huge as well. All right, I didn't really understand how these fleets secure their build slots with the OEMs, and you know how they only have so many that's going to be up for uh, eligibility to rotate out of the fleet. And they're probably selling them to other countries, I would imagine. I don't know um, if they're keeping them here, but when the new uh, fleet rotation comes in. Then they just secure those build slots uh, from the OEMs. Hylion is looking to secure those build slots, right? So when the integration comes from these companies, that is what a reservation is, is a, a basically a pledge to Hylion to, um, to, um, to identify how many of those build slots uh, can be eligible for um, upgrading to maybe potentially um, a, a Hylion solution rather than just going about it um, the traditional way with securing those build slots with new diesel trucks off the OEM. And y you start to really look at this opportunity holistically, and it's like, man, alive, this is really exciting times. It really is, man. The, the ability to roll this solution down the road, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the fleet feedback as we get a little bit deeper here into the slide bank. But man alive, the, 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 the uh, feedback that they received was overwhelming. And um, I knew it was a good product, but man, if nothing else for me, it fortified it during the call. Um, and the, the, again, the confidence that was demonstrated by the CEO, um, my, my hats go off to him. I, I, th I think he knocked it out of the park. Um, I, I think, you know, having Sherry Baker on the team, Sherry Baker is phenomenal. Um, I've said that ever since she came on board. She is absolutely fantastic. She has command over over the finances in this company and 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 to align that strategic direction and understanding what this company could step into in the future is is just awesome it's great to be a part of it and um, it'll be exciting to see once they get to that breaking point where we're like oh my goodness Hylion's not gonna not only gonna do it but the question is to what extent now, that's gonna be the scary question and quite frankly it's the to what extent um, that drives my bullish thesis and drives why I'm so convicted on this company going forward uh, into the future. So the results of the fleet experience, a hypertruck ride along, drive events. Uh, so they talked about a few things on the call. I'll highlight them now. They could not tell when the generator kicks on. 
So imagine driving this thing down the road and it's silent, right? And the generator kicks on. And the driver cannot tell when the generator kicks on to charge the batteries and then kicks off again, right? To when the, dry, the generator kicks on and then it kicks off again to go to full electric. So this thing has the ability to go from a generator on and charging mode to a generator off full electric mode um, without even a without even any awareness to the to the to the driver when those goings on are happening that they've made their transition uh, from those two phases of full electric to a charging phase beautifully and this is from the fleet this isn't my opinion these were shared on the call and if you guys want to understand more about Hylion I highly suggest that you listen to the call if you haven't already I read the transcript first then I listen to the call. I always do that. I force myself to do it so I don't get lazy on the call specifically. Um, but it shifts much smoother than a diesel truck um, and it's a lot quieter than most of the BEV trucks out there. So there was no range anxiety and then other BEVs tested have a hundred miles before the recharge. So <coughs> I thought this was key and Thomas Healy mentioned it multiple times on the call that it was incredible uh, when he talked about the 100 miles over and over again. I actually thought that some of the BEV applications were getting significantly more than that. And that must not be true. It must not be true for the reasons that I've stated in previous Hylion videos in that you imagine a battery. A battery doesn't, it doesn't allow it to be drawn upon equally because it, it, it's based on the demand that's put over the battery system, okay? So you imagine a long-haul trucking going up a hill. It's going to put more of a demand on that full electric battery, thus requiring it to be charged in less time, okay? And this is what fleets are scared to death of. Fleets have to be assured that that truck can go out on its route and return back to receive its charge in, in a... In a, in a, in a, in a a predictable manner. It's not predictable to put it out there on the open highway, right? With uh, the the open questions that they have about real performance. And Thomas Healy chalked it up at a hundred miles. I, I thought this was kind of a this was a pop shot, and it was a good one. And good for Thomas for going on the offensive and saying, you know what? They're getting way too much favor in this gig. Is try to scrutinize what they can actually do over the road. And you'll find that there's only a, a very few, if not the only, solution out there, um, which is highly on that can boast that thousand miles of extended range on their unit. Okay. Requires no new infrastructure. That was one of the the, the uh, real feedbacks uh, from the fleets. Remember, this isn't my opinion. This isn't Thomas Healy talking about what he's talked about over the last twenty months of the company. These are the fleets providing this feedback to Thomas Healy that's being uh, demonstrated or, or communicated on the call. No new infrastructure necessary. This is huge from a fleet perspective, right? Um, the truck keeps the same look. How many times have we said this, guys? How many times have we said this? And we're talking about it during a time now where the stock is at $4. And a lot of people are, are, are like, okay, yeah, sure, Ryan, whatever. It's the same old song and dance. That, that's fine. If you think that the stock is going to stay $4 for the next 10 years, no problem. You're entitled to your opinion. As asinine of an opinion as I believe that to be, you're entitled to your opinion. If you think that the stock is going to go to zero, you're entitled to your opinion. No problem. But I just think that at some point you have to acknowledge the progress that's being made. And I'm actually trying to read between the lines here, guys. I'm trying to identify that I'm, I'm not doing backflips for $200,000 of, of revenue that was garnered in 2021. I'm, I'm not doing that. What I am suggesting is that maybe that it's proof of much better times in the, into the future in this company's ability to generate and garner interest in the industry and sell their products to that industry uh, in the end. Now the question is, can they ramp up in in volume production. This slide speaks to that. This was a complete surprise to me. This blew me out of the water and I don't know if some of you guys had the same reaction as me when I came to this slide. The orders for 100 units backed by deposits to secure hypertruck production slots 
So I don't know if that was 100 on their existing 1900 and 1600 or 1590 uh, existing backlog. It would be nice to actually have uh, at least 100 of those uh, or if those were new orders, okay? It doesn't suggest that on the slide. It suggests that these 100, they were able to get security deposits put down um, on those production slots because they probably went to their Hypertruck Innovation Council and said, hey guys, great. Thank you so much for your interest, but here's the thing. If you're going to put in orders, now is the time to start to uh, receive your competitive edge and slot in the queue against the order backlog because if you're just a naked reservation, you're going to get put to the bottom line, uh, to, the, to the bottom of the queue if you don't have any money to pony up. Thomas Healy said that it was in the amounts of thousands of dollars to secure these slots. I believe him. I do. Um, I believe that this was a significant amount of dollars that were garnered to secure these spots, uh, and it just really represented the interest from the fleets out there um, that um, uh, as to uh, their commitment to the solution going forward. Now, the additional 325 of future production slots, that was great, too. Um, additional reservations for the future production slots. That was, a, that was a huge catalyst here. And then finally, the five fleets operating nearly 500 trucks. Um, I didn't know any of these companies. Uh, I, I, if you're in the trucking industry, I'm sure that you do. I did not. This was a, a, a pleasant surprise to me. Um, fly five fleets operating nearly 500 trucks. I, th I thought that was a huge, um, huge win for the company here. So uh, as we cru cruise down here, um, the, the ride and drive events I've kind of already talked about the feedback, um, the strong performance. We knew that fleets are going to get to increase their payload. These are going to be some of the verifications. Thomas talked about this in that a fleet that picks up two or three trucks on the onset isn't a good or bad order. It just a representative of the commitment that fleets are willing to take on and do the internal validation for themselves. Now, if the, if through the internal validation, the Hylion solution knocks it out of the park and they can find that they can tow more payload. They can uh, find uh, cost savings over the life of the truck through TCO and they can uh, introduce an alternative solution to diesel into their application. This is going to be a home run. And then those follow-on orders are going to come and the increase in order flow will come for each of the respective fleets. That's just how it's going to turn out. The power trained viewed as a superior to competitors, that's huge. Rings and anxiety we've talked about, the no new infrastructure we've talked about, and can be an effective tool for recruiting and retaining drivers. We talked about that a little bit in that this is new technology. What a wonderful way of attracting new talent to the industry to say, look, the, the rigors of over the road trucking have to be rethought. And this is something that even Thomas Healy admitted that he overlooked, uh, as I did, uh, as a lot of people didn't really talk about, I mean, I, I give myself a little credit, I have been talking about the driver experience, but um, I didn't want to overstate my, um, my knowledge of over-the-road trucking because I'm not a driver, but I do have a lot of drivers in my community that can maybe speak to the, the attractive nature of the driving a truck that is a little bit more quiet or a little bit easier on the body to drive. Um, a, a little bit more taking into consideration the comforts, um, the technology, and the features and functionalities that are made available to the driver um, with the Hylion solution. And so using that technology to attract new talent to the industry, I thought was a net positive. Um, the timeline hasn't changed. That was good. Um, they did not extend upon the timeline, rather double down on it. Um, they did earmark here the uh, status completion of the Hypertruck uh, innovate the events that were run uh, into fall and winter of last year going into the first of this year. Those have continued. Um, and then the timeline as we start, um, um, you know, progressing forward toward that second half of 2023. I'm great. I can wait. I, I, I can be patient. I'm interested to see this right here. If you're looking at this here and you're saying, okay, well, it's not going to happen for another 10 years, which was a comment that I just received this morning on the channel, no problem. I, I, I've stopped disagreeing and agreeing with people because it seems like that's all people want to do is just throw some uh, random statement out there 
or opinion without any fact base behind it. You could be lucky, you could be right, it could take 10 years for this to come to fruition. Um, I, once this gets to this phase right here, you don't think with the interest in the industry to uh, adopt these solutions um, isn't real at this point. Um, I questioned the fleet, uh, the fleet's interest in adopting these solutions before the Q4 call. I don't anymore. I don't. Um, I heard and I want that fortified every quarter from now on uh, as a shareholder in this company that the fleets are still chomping at the bit to get a hold of these solutions. And I believe that they are. I believe that the feedback has been positive. I believe they're ready. Uh, I believe everything we thought was going to transpire has to this point. And I think we just need to get past this 2022 right here, the winter testing, the onboard, the validation, and the road testing and validation within controlled test fleets. Thomas Healy has been steadfast on this as a critical milestone in the company, and it is a must. And he said something during the call that just blew my mind. He said, we cannot enter into mass scale production without these test fleet verifications and making sure that we've got all the kinks worked out. I mean, he didn't say that to that extent, but it's the first time I've heard him really identify why he's doing this, why he's doing what it is that he's doing, and then the expanded fleet trials in the first half of 23, um, and, and then the uh, certifications from NHTSA, EPA, and the CARB, right, which will allow them eligibility for the, um, the fuel credits, which is going to be huge, man. If, if they're eligible for credits against that, that's all earnings to the bottom line to Hylion if they're eligible through the grant program uh, to enjoy some of the um, uh, some of the ZEV credits that are available um, through through the grant program. I think that's going to be huge. But we we got a ways to go to get to that. We've got a lot of work to go through. Um, I look at it more of being an evolution to that pro to that process. Um, and and this is where the the, the company really stands. The biggest chance of really uh, re-identifying itself, um, reimagining itself. Where can the prospects go? Um, how can we expect to build out um, expected orders quarter after quarter? And then once those become a lot more predictable, then we can start to uh, assign metrics. And and we can't do it until then. Um, I know Mark Fisher and Mark, uh, Mark Delaney and and uh, Fisher want to do that right now. The, those, those two analysts, they drive me up the freaking wall. Uh, it, it's, it's just insane um, where their motives lie. I just don't get it. Um, it must be nice to just look at a company and say, well, the company's obviously going through some rough times and they're trying to evolve. And then to just play into that and, 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 and basically set their price targets off of the short term, um, it'll be interesting to see them evolve uh, as, as highly on surprises to the upside. I, I, I'd love to see a buying frenzy on this company. I really would. I'd love to see, you know, some real buying interest from what was turned out because savvy investors are going to look at this call and be like, I need to be in this company. It's that simple. I've been doing this a long, long time. And this is now more of an investable company after the Q4 call than it was before, I believe. And, um, you know, it might just take a whale to step in and say, you know what, I'm over it. I'm in. Uh, you know, we've got two short years for the potential of, of what, 100, 125 X on this company. Uh, it, it's insane what this thing could do. It, it is insane. And the opportunity here at $4, uh, it's just, it's, it's really quite amazing um, that we are now working against the next 24 months uh, before we uh, start ramp up and, and um, mass scale of, of the Hypertruck solution. It's going to be a lot of fun. And every month that goes by is one month down in the books toward that end. Um, so let's start the countdown now, guys. I appreciate it, and I'm, I'm, I'm super glad to be there with you on this, on this journey. Installed the first hybrid EX units in 2021. Of course, that was good. We know some of the companies that um, have, have uh, enjoyed and put that to work. Um, talked about the competing 15-liter engine from Cummins. Um, I, I don't agree with Thomas Healy on this. I don't. I, I think, and I hopefully highly on hybrid EX commercialization to continue based on fleet demand isn't an opportunity for a cop-out on the hybrid EX. Um, I hope it's more defined as, hey, let's let the industry define 
where it is they have a place for the hybrid EX product. Um, I, I just never really understood looking at the Cummins uh, engine as, yes, direct competition, yes, but not an end-all, be-all to the solution, okay? You can still run the hybrid product with the 15-liter engine. It's a CNG engine. If you want the additional horsepower, you can put the hybrid, uh, hybrid EX solution on with the 15-liter engine. So I, I'm not really sure if I understand the whole look if applications for CNG want to take that engine and put it into a service that allows them the payload that is um, um, uh, on it on the equivalent to what that 15 liter natural gas engine could do, right? Then so be it. But where those applications are for these other CNG engines that are on the market and need that additional horsepower, I think the hybrid EX absolutely has its place in the industry. And this is just where I see it different than Thomas Healy. And honestly, I wish he would stop mentioning this because there's been a lot of questions garnered around this. Steve Fisher did ask about this. Do you just do you consider all the R&D that went into the hybrid EX product to be null and void? And of course, Thomas gives the explanation that the information that has been garnered over the evolution of the EX product has segued nicely into the Hypertruck ERX. But I think as a standalone product, I think there is a lack of acknowledgement to the potential in the product. I mean, they're putting a two to $3 million uh, earnings forecast on it for this year in 2022, and it's going to be solely driven by the hybrid EX. Sherry Baker talked about the potential for some of those revenues between the two and three million to come via retrofit, and she said off of the OEM line as a new install. So it's it's hard to garner where those are going to come from, but a retrofit is twice as expensive but less efficient in, in so far as it's harder to do, whereas installing it off the OEM line is easy, right? You take the new product, you push it over to them, you install it right off the line, it's easy. You don't have any interference from any of the other products. It can be uh, installed at the time that is most conducive to where it is on the OEM line when, it, when it's rolling off, right? As opposed to going into you know, a dirty truck and perhaps maybe even modifying the truck in certain capacities or working around certain things that have been uh, installed on the truck since it's been turned out new to put that uh, uh, hybrid EX product on their retrofit, okay? This is just where I, I differ. I wish he would stop talking about it. Nikola wouldn't do that. Nikola wouldn't say, hey, this product that we have is is uh, going to be obsolete in two years because of a 15-liter engine. I just don't think the two really speak to each other. Uh, as much as um, Thomas Heaney, Healy would like to admit, um, that to, to, to suggest somehow that um, the hybrid EX solution is, is going to suffer for it. Now, I do agree with Thomas Healy in the reception in industry, um, holding back a little bit, and allowing this technology to move to more of a range extender prog uh, program and understanding that probably, you know, a, a vast majority of the interest lies on the full electric um, or the range extender side of the house. I do understand that. And if that is the case and the consensus that's being turned back from the fleet, um, then so be it, right? The hybrid EX will, um, will suffer in its ability to, um, to garner interest in the industry, but who cares? Um, the flagship product is the Hypertruck ERX. That's where it's going to be made um, in, in, in its hundreds of million dollars of revenue. I, I, I said that the figures that were forecasted on the onset for the hybrid sales anyway was not going to garner enough sales to keep this ship afloat anyway. So it's not really going to matter that much. The only thing that really matters um, is, is the products, uh, the Hypertruck ERX products, both on the hydrogen fuel cell uh, and the renewable natural gas side of the house, okay? Talked about the talent uh, and the team expansion, both Sherry and Jay joining the team, both with Meritor Pedigree. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me about the Meritor Cummins deal. Uh, why? Just listen to Thomas's response. Said they had a discussion with them, nothing is gonna change, nothing is gonna affect their um, ability to, to garner the axles that they need uh, to turn out their, their product over the long term. And I don't know if it sets highly up, on up uh, better for a takeover uh, into the future. If this stock gets up to 20, 25 bucks, 30, 35 bucks or whatever, um, you know, and they're, they're able to, to really garner an interest and, and show that the, 
um, the industry really wants to shift in this direction. Um, I, I, I don't see why they wouldn't be a takeover a target at all uh, if they're, they're garnering that kind of interest. I think the interest for a takeover would be much earlier than that, but there has been no discussion of that. And, um, you know, we'll just have to monitor the progress that they make on their own uh, going forward with the talent that they've brought on here for new industry veterans. I've mentioned that. Um, so, so very cool, focused on both the Hybrid EX and the Hypertruck ERX solutions. So just fantastic here. Here's, here's the roadmap here um, that we've got uh, to move into the fuel agnostic and the Hypertruck, uh, the, uh, the fuel cell, the hydrogen fuel cell. They did mention, mention the opportunity for some reoccurring revenue with the, uh, the onboard monitoring system. I thought that was great. Um, long-term opportunities with both their battery solutions and a multi-use application. I have no doubt that this will be put into a number of different applications as Hylion expands. Um, there's too many use cases for this not to, but their focus in the short term is right here. And the short term is over the next 24 months, and I believe after 24 months, we'll be there. And then the advanced software solutions here, when they talked about that being a potential revenue driver uh, into the future, and it will be. It's, it's, it certainly will be. Um, here's the books as they shake out. Um, here is the selling general and administrative cost that I talked about here. This is the year ending uh, uh, fourth, fourth quarter 2021. Uh, kind of interesting here at 9.2 million of cost there uh, for basically your administrative cost. Just a double from Q4 of, of uh, the same period before in Q4 of, of, of 20. So I thought that was interesting. Um, that was an advance of 4.3 million um, year over year. So just a slight increase here. Guys, this is nothing. Um, this, this, this works well for me. Um, the increase here quarter over uh, year over year, basically 12.9 million. Uh, fourth quarter of 2020, 4.5 million to 17.4 million. Uh, the quarter ending uh, 2021. This is awesome. We got to see this. This is huge. Um, they do not mind putting their money or their money where their mouth is in in, in in this regard. This is huge. This is a big expenditure. And when you look at the 200000 of revenue here in, in sales in um, the fourth quarter, 2021, um, it seems anemic when you're looking at a, an R&D budget of $17.4 million. And I, I expect this to stay pretty consistent. Um, I expect them to spend this much um, uh, quarter over quarter. I, I really do, and it's a it's a big part of their budget. Um, there's no doubt. It's it's a huge part of their budget. I mean, look at that, 58 million in 2021, um, and and this is where you you have to look at this and say it's hard to put a tangible, um, you know, a tangible metric on this to say God, they're burning through cash. Yeah, but where's the cash going? That 60 million right there of R&D burn is going to show up in spades when they start to turn this product out. It's just that simple. Um, guidance for 2022, two to three mil. Um, not immaterial anymore. I, I, I'm going to do away with that. Um, Sherry Baker did away with it, so I will as well. Two to three million is not immaterial. Fails in comparison to talk about the operating expense here, but what what is going to take this revenue up to an amount to where this operating expense here is is more than covered. Uh, this needs to step into the hundreds of millions of dollars of range, hundreds of millions. And if we're able to garner two and three million, um, I will I will suggest that that is what it is in 2022. But it's going to be that step from this is low scale uh, volume production, guys. That's where this two to three million in revenue comes from. And to Sherry Baker's point. This is made up 100% from the hybrid EX sales. Um, I would think that to be a, a positive, actually, for a solution that they're not really that excited about and communicating that maybe even the industry isn't that excited about, you know, as, as kind of a bridge solution to uh, a full range extender or a BEV solution into the future. But um, who's to say? It's going to be fun to monitor it and see how they, how they leverage this product and then total operating expenses here with the expansion of the team and just the increase of, of, of expenditures and um, the research and development budget uh, increasing. But I did talk about the cash position here, 557 total 
of cash, cash equivalents, short and long-term investments, et cetera, et cetera. Short and long-term investments are uh, a combination of um, investments that um, have a 36-month expiry, no longer than 36 e expiration. I find it interesting because we're about two years away, right? So some of those investments you might as well put away in 118 million uh, and 180 million respectively in each of those categories really does solidify um, how wonderful of a, of a uh, financial position this company is in going forward. And it, it's going to be exciting. You know, I, I, different schools of thought look at this and they say, well, you know, they're, they're burning cash too fast. I, I, I don't really see how that rationale fits into this equation. I don't. It, it's, it's a sentiment that I wholeheartedly disagree with. I, I think it's silly. I think if we didn't have any interest in any of the products, um, I, I think I would have to agree. But after that fourth quarter call, man, I was able to extract much more of a positive tone by both Sherry and Thomas in expressing how incredible of an opportunity that we are looking at here um, with the highly on opportunity as they as they step toward that that milestone in 2023. And that that's going to be the big one. Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, guys. In summary, I was I was super super stoked. Um, my expectations were revenue for were a million. Um, they came up eight hundred thousand short. Um, it was on the low end of what I talked about for units sold. I was a little confused about that. Um, am I going to say that it's just an absolute fall over yourself to go buy the stock because they generated two hundred thousand? No, I, I think the real bullish conviction or the the, the the bullish sentiment around the company at this point is their ability to generate revenue and their ability to, to, to build on that uh, revenue going forward. Um, the train doesn't stop. Once it's set in motion for a company like this, it doesn't go backwards. Um, they're going to go through revenue light and they're going to go through uh, revenue heavy uh, quarters as this company evolves. But does the company have the pedigree necessary to step into 2023, especially the back half, um, in a position that has everything firing on all cylinders. How's the team? Well, the team is good. How's the product? Product is good. Based on the industry feedback, um, how is the cash position? Are they well positioned to step into what they're forecasting in 2023 after all approvals are met, after all certifications are met, after all the controlled fleet uh, demonstrations and, and fleet integrations are done and they're able to really scrutinize the product under the rigors of actual fleet application. Thomas Ely talked about this. There was so many granular nuggets on this Q4 call closing out of 2021 that it, it was hard to articulate. That's why I came out with a short video and a long video on this because I wanted to discuss a little bit more my insights on what I took away from the call. And on the short video, I know there's just a lot of people who want to know the granular nuggets. So I thought there was 30 positives that came from the call. So I just fired away at those 30 and, and provided those in a, in a short video for those folks that didn't want my insight. Because honestly, I, all I'm doing is just reacting to what I felt like was um, a, a very, very positive call and we needed it. We needed to go out of 2021 um, on a high note, enter into 2022. This is going to be the bridge year. Uh, this is going to be this is going to be tough. I don't think it's going to be as tough as 2021. I thought 2021 uh, probably has the potential to go in the books as the toughest year in the history of Hylion. Um And I'm saying it now, and I, I'm saying it loud and proud. I, I, 2021 was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, it, it drove me to frustration, to you know, to to banter on Twitter in a way that doesn't make me happy to do. Um, the uh, periods of silence when I felt felt like Hylion was not being as forthcoming as they needed to be. Um, e whether those criticisms were warranted or not, I chalk 2021 up as being an extremely difficult year. And I thought Q4 was a good culmination uh, uh, in the face of a very dismal year to go out on a high note going into 2022. Now this is a bridge year. If this stock remains at $4 a share all the way through 2022, I will be extremely surprised. I think we're going to see a slow drift up, and I think there's going to be a few gap ups. The only way that you're going to enjoy 
those gap ups in Hylion is to own the stock. I've said this many, many times. You're not going to be able to time this stock. No way. Thomas Healy did a great job of forecasting that there was going to be a lot of orders and they were going to be aggressively going after this uh, backlog in their order book. This is huge, guys. I've said this for many, many times. The question is, what is that number going to be at when we step into ladder 2023? Is it going to be 1,590? Is it going to be 2,500? Is it going to be 5,000? Could it be 8,500, as some might suggest? I don't know, but it certainly could be. And if they get to work right now in solidifying that backlog in the order book, it's just going to fortify their position as they step into 2023 and, and look to ramp up and start to fill those orders and get this product out on a mass scale so that these fleets can finally realize what we've realized for the last two years in this opportunity in that this solution is very, very real. The feedback is very, very real. The opportunity is very, very real. And it, 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 it's going to run out of time here, guys. When we start to close the gap between this stock price and the goings-on at Hylion Holdings, as they really start to fortify some of their vision to be the leading powertrain provider, uh, electrified powertrain solution uh, for their fleets going forward, and this, the clock starts now. We're less than 24 months out and re realizing that vision. And I, I say get on board or get out of the way at this point, honestly. If you want to continue to wait, continue to wait. If you want to wait 10 years to invest in the company, 10 years down the line, you may be paying $100 plus for this company, um, not $4 a share. Guys, I appreciate you joining the message. Leave your comments at the bottom of the video. Really appreciate your support um, as we um, foot stomp this message on a very frequent basis every week. I'll continue to do that until I deem it necessary not to um, in providing transparency on the evolution of this company. A lot to unpack in this call, a lot. Anybody who watched it, who's covered this company would agree with me. And, and, and that is why I was really looking forward to this one. This was a very important video to get all of the insights, all of the granular nuggets, everything that was turned out uh, during the call as we step toward a brighter future with Highly on Holdings. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future.